What percent of trading is mental? Anybody? 90. 90? No one's saying 100. Please, there's not 100 of them, right? So, okay, good. It's not 100. 90 percent mental. Does anybody think it's less than that? What's the lowest you think? What's the lowest number out there? 70 percent? Anybody lower than 70? 50 percent? Anybody think it's 50 percent mental? It's a reasonable expectation. Some people might think that. 50 percent mental. 50 percent? Here's the compelling question I want to ask you about today. If it's 90 percent mental, if it's 70 percent mental, if it's even 50 percent mental, what percent of your time and resources do you spend working on your mental game? Compelling question. Because the differentiation of mediocrity and greatness in trading is actually not that complex of a concept. I'm going to share with you some of the things that I've learned over the years in working with the best of the best, helping them sharpen their game. My background. I have a PhD in psychology with a specialization in sports psychology. People ask me all the time, why do I bother clarifying that? I'll make it very quick and simple for you. Sir, what's your name? Constantine. Constantine? Nice to meet you. I'm Doug. Would you like to hear about my personal problems? You cold-hearted person. I make a joke of it because I decided a long time ago to not be a therapist, to not be a counseling psychologist. I wanted to focus on performance, improving performance. Initially, it started with athletes because I was a baseball player. I played Division I baseball in college. I was a catcher. Catcher in baseball is a unique position if you're not familiar with the sport. It's the one position on the field that you see everything unfold in front of you. Everything. It's the only position you see that. Other sports, you get a perspective of half the game or part of the game. As a catcher, you actually see the whole game. And you can't control the pace of the game. Strategy thinking. Herniated disc in my lower back. That was the end of baseball for me. Had surgery. Went to go work on the trading floors in Chicago, actually at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. That's where my career started. And I thought to myself, this is the greatest job in the world. I am surrounded by like-minded people, other competitive athletes, other individuals who wanted to compete, who were used to competing, except I hated it. On the trading floor, it actually was all about the money. That's all that mattered. If the person next to you fell down and dropped, all you cared about was, does he or she have a better spot in the pit? And if so, then you take that spot. I'm a team-minded athlete. I have a higher level of empathy. And I realized, I don't really love this. Fortunately, a herniated disc in my back. I re-injured my back. And that was the end of that. Doctor said, basically, find a way to make a living sitting down, because you can't do this anymore. No problem, doc. I hate what I'm doing anyway. Love baseball, I'll go be poor and happy the rest of my life. My big plan was to be a baseball coach. My thought process was I love baseball. Money could be secondary, if at all. So then I went back to school to study sports psychology. Now, traditional sports psychology, anybody familiar with sports psychology, concepts of it? A lot of it is related. If you play golf or tennis, I know they use some sports psychologists for the rugby teams. It's about visualization. It's about focusing under pressure, about goal setting, but a lot of it's about relaxation strategies. You teach athletes, the assumption is that you have the skill set, right? That's the assumption. And you teach them how to focus better under pressure so when the game is on the line, they perform at the top of their game. Well, I got a job offer to go in house with a, with a hedge fund to be their performance trading coach. The job didn't exist. They just liked the idea of my sports psychology background and come on board and our traders, we have a thousand of them, thousand prop traders. They're athletes, they'll relate to you very well. Okay, that made sense. After the first year, the feedback I got from the traders, we're still losing money. We just feel better about it now. And that's when I realized. I can't make a living doing that. And so I started to study behavioral finance. I started to study cognitive biases. I started to figure out why is it that smart people, talented, skilled people, when it comes to money and decision making with the trading process, they lose their discipline. And how many times as a trader have you said to yourself, if I had only stuck to my game plan, or if I just trusted myself, or if I hadn't listened to the other person's opinions and just focus on the inside?
You're gonna laugh today. I'm entertaining at the very least. But you'll also learn, and that's very important to me. I want you to walk out of here with something, and it's gonna be more than one thing, that you actually can put into place immediately on your next trade. I'm gonna show you process. I'm gonna show you things and techniques and strategies that I have used and worked with over the past 20 years, and I know they work. And in your bags is my coaching manual. It's a 60-page book. Each chapter is three pages. There's no case studies. It's, this is going to happen. Here's how to solve it. This is what to do. This is how to think about it. I'm not here to tell you what to trade or how to trade. I'm here to help you take whatever your process is and make it the best it can be by showing you some of the things that I've used that I know work and some of the things that I've used over the years that I know don't work. And I'll tell you what doesn't work, thinking happy thoughts. That doesn't work. Hoping, wishing, and praying. That doesn't work either, by the way. Process. Focusing on the process. This will be highly interactive. I may call on you. If you don't want me to call on you, please just stare down. I won't get offended. Just look down at your notes or whatever it is. Stare at your feet. But if you're staring at me, you're free game. Because I can't read minds, right? I'm, I'm looking. You might be daydreaming. I'll say, sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass you. I'll move on to the next person. Right? But just those are my parameters. I want you to learn. Interacting, learning from each other, and learning from the knowledge that I can give you today. What's the most important skill in great trading? What's that? The third one. Controlling your emotions. Anybody else? Not losing money. Okay, risk management. Number four, establishing game plans and sticking to them. What's that? Number two, risk management. We talked about that discipline. All of them. Good. I like the way you're thinking because this is the single most important skill for great trading. That one word. What's that word? Edge. That's it. That one word. That is the single most important skill for great trading. And just so we're clear, I'm not talking about black edge. I'm not talking about that illegal stuff. What I am talking about is two things. The first one is called probability weighted decision making. It's a lot bigger word than the complexity of it. Trust me, I'll walk you through it. You're going to learn how to do it. You already do it already. I'm going to show you how to apply it to your trading and thought process. And the second one is having a consistent trading process. Let's start with the first one, probability weighted decision making. You ever been to a casino? Familiar with roulette? We know the game? I'm going to use that as an example to help you prime the thinking process along this. So in roulette, how many numbers are on the wheel? European roulette. You know there's a difference between European roulette and American roulette. Does anybody know there's a difference? Talk about that in a second, right? How many numbers are on the wheel? Who said? 57 numbers. I'm going to show you in a second. How many numbers do we know how many in the wheel? Anybody? 34. How many are red? How many are black? Half and half, right? It's about half and half, though, right? Good. Everybody, about half and half. How many even? How many odd? It's about half and half. This is actually a remarkable thing. That is a roulette wheel, European roulette wheel. The difference between the European roulette wheel and the American roulette wheel is European roulette wheel has one green zero. The American roulette wheel has two of those. They have a green zero which is a number, and then they have a green double zero, which I'm pretty sure is not a number that exists, but nonetheless, it's on the wheel. Interesting. But what's odd about that is it's green. They're, casinos are very smart people. I'm going to show you what they do to us, and let's see if we can learn from them and think about how to apply that to our trading process. That's what the board looks like. Now, if you notice, these are actually, their, their whole methodology is based on not only probabilities, but based on making things socially uncomfortable for you. So if you're at the roulette wheel, and I'm standing over here, and I, if I wanted to bet on green zero, I actually have to reach across the table or talk to the person next to me to put my, it's not an easy thing to do. If you've ever experienced that, try it. And if you haven't experienced it, I encourage you to go to one of the, just as a learning experience. I'm not encouraging you to become a degenerate gambler. What I am encouraging you to do, though, is to think and understand what exists with these things. And that's the odds. Now, my friend over here, what was your name? Fine. Yes. Fine. Fabio. Fabio said it's about 
half red, half black. You're right. It feels like it's 50-50. But there's actually a mathematical element in here. Your actual percent chance of winning is actually only 47%, not 50-50. That doesn't sound like a big difference, does it? 47 to 50%. That's a 2.7 edge. That casino only wants that game played forever because they are guaranteed to make 2.7%. That's why they build buildings in the desert in the United States. That's why they build them on islands in Macau. It's because of that simple concept. The games are mathematically in their advantage and our disadvantage. And you know what they do? They do other stuff. They give us alcohol. They make the chips the same size. The floor's all messed up. You ever been to Vegas? It's like torture land, OK? Sensories getting hit everywhere. There are people half dressed walking around. There's no windows. You can't get out of the place. It's all intentional. You go out for a late night, come home at 6 in the morning, and guess what? Roulette's still being played. And you think, do these people go to sleep? The answer is no, they don't, because it's a mathematical game. What's your name? What's your lucky number? Doesn't really matter, does it? I'm not a mean guy. I'm just being direct. I want you to learn. Your lucky number is irrelevant in that game, because it's just as likely to come up as green zero as What's your lucky number? Yes. Seven. Lucky number seven. Probability is the same. And they throw another element that really is psychological cruelty. It's called the Cyclops. You know what the Cyclops is? This is actually mean. That's the Cyclops. It's actually this thing, a digital board next to the roulette wheel that shows you the past 10, 15, 20 spins. So when you start seeing a pattern of reds come up that many times, is your next bet going to be on red or black? No, one next to you. Yeah, red or black? Red. Red. Anybody betting on black? Black. You're all wrong. That's the beauty of this game. But if you're betting red, you think red's hot. Or you're saying to yourself, you're caught by the bottom number there, aren't you? You're saying, well, red's only come up 41% of the time today. So it's what? Do. That's the mental game. You want to approach this like a trader without the emotions, without the influence of your biases and opinions about your lucky number, was it 26? And your lucky number seven. You want to come to it with the idea of how to think in probabilities? Then all you need to know is that if you play roulette, you're playing for recreation, not as a way to earn a living. I want you to hold that in your head. Because what I find over and over again is you trade sometimes for recreation. And I'm going to show you how. And I'm going to show you why. And all I ask you to do is stop doing it. Why do you trade? To try to make some money? Go to the casino. You can try to make some money. Why do you trade, sir? To try to make money or to make money? Ah, oh, let's do that. Does anybody here trade to make money? Please raise your hand. I didn't ask you if you actually do make money. I want to know if you trade to make money. Is that the reason why? Is anybody here trading to make friends? You are. At least you're honest. Trade, I trade to make money. If you trade, you know why casinos exist? They exist to make money. That's why they exist. They figured out the formula, and I want you to think about it and how you can figure it out for yourself. So think like a casino means using probability-weighted decision-making process to help you make objective decisions rather than the emotionally driven ones. Does anybody have a pound on them? Pound coin? Someone in the room? Yeah. You do. Awesome. Come on up here. I'm Doug. I know in a seat. Hi. Okay. What's your name? Ed. Ed, nice to meet you. Ed, I got a seat for you right there. Ed's going to help us out today. Thank you, Ed. Now, I'm going to poke fun at everybody, including Ed, but it's just because I want you to learn. So work with me on this, and we're going to learn about how to think in probabilities on a real example with Ed as our helper. All right, Ed, so do you have a pound? I have a pound. This is not a magic trick. Okay? If you can't see, stand up. It's well worth it. Trust me, crowd the stage. You're going to love this one. You validate they're both pounds. Real coins? Uh, and can you, can you look at the, there's heads and tails to them? Sure is. Yep. 
All right. Fifty pence. You validate that's heads and tails, or two sides of a different coin. Great, you hold that one. Here's the game. You hold it, you flip it, you call heads or tails in the air. If you get it right, I'll give you my one pound. You get it wrong, you give me your pound. Would you like to play that game? I would. Raise your hand if you're playing that game. Only three of you are playing that game? You're playing the game? How about this? Raise your hand if you're thinking to yourself, I play that game, it's just a pound, who cares, it's not a big deal. Raise your hand if that's, it's a very honest answer, great. That's the worst answer in the world. And I'm going to show you why that's the worst answer. But it's a very common one. Right now, write down on a piece of paper what's a lot of money to spend on dinner for two people. Go ahead, write it down. A lot of money to spend on dinner for two people. Don't show anybody. Quickly jot it down. I don't have time to ask everybody. We'll get back to you in a second, Ed. Don't you worry. We ready? Now I have an anchoring problem. I'm going to ask someone how much they put down. If that person put a very high number, the, other, the person with a low number is going to feel awkward. If you put a low number and I call on you, you're going to feel awkward. But I've got to take the risk here because I can't collect everybody's how much they can spend for dinner. So, sir, how much do you, what would you put down? 600 pounds. <laughs> what are you doing tonight? <laughs> what would you put down? Yeah. Oh, he put six. What'd you put? 120. 120, we're getting there. What'd you put? Yeah. 100 pounds. Anybody less than 100 pounds? Oh, there we go. What'd you put down? 60 pounds. Anybody less than 60? Good. So here's what I've assessed from that sample size. You're broke, and you're the richest guy in the room. Is that a fair assessment? I have no idea. It's personal value systems. My point is, is the market doesn't know your value system. You just made a decision based on, well, a pound is not a big deal to me. By that same logic, if I said it's 100 pounds versus 100 pounds, you'd probably say, I wouldn't play it because it's what? Too much money. That's not the question I'm asking. This is a math question. It's a math question. You can play that game? Yes, I am. Anybody not playing that game? You're being difficult in the back. You wouldn't play the game either? Why not? He's one of them. <laughs> Let me know when you're done. I'll, I'll keep on going. You good? All right. 5P. Same game. You flip it. You call it heads or tails. You get it right. You get my one pound five. You get it wrong. I get your pound. Would you play that game? Of course you would. You're a degenerate. You'd have played it the first time. Would you play this game? No. Ah, now we have a learning point. Because I'm sure he's a very smart man. He just basically told me that he would not play this game. What is the mathematical advantage you have in this game? It's a math question. 50-50 is the probability. What's the payout? 5p. Half the time, that's what percent? 5P represents a 5% return, and half the time, because you're going to get it right half and wrong half, is a 2.5% return. Did I remind you that they build buildings in the desert because of this concept? Your answer to me should only be, I want to play that forever. What did you get distracted by? The amount. It's just 5P. What did you not think about? The percentages. By definition, is this a small edge or a big edge? Small, right? This would be, Ed, do you have any edge here? No? We're going to make you do a great trader review before the end of the night. Don't you worry about that. These are not complicated concepts. I'm just getting you to slow the thinking down. No edge, no bet. Small edge, small bet. This is 420 pounds. Keep your hands in your pocket, please. Would you play the game now? Of course you would, because you're a degenerate the first time you're playing the game when it's even, why, you know, why not? Now you've got real money on the table in your mind, so you're thinking to yourself, have I changed anything about the probabilities of this game? No. It's still a 50-50 game. Do you know what 45 to 55% is? Do you know what that number is? Tattoo 
it to your body if you want to make money in trading. Because 45 to 55 percent is the average winning percentage of discretionary traders. That's not my opinion. That's what the risk managers and the data over two decades pulls 45 to 55 percent. So how do the elite traders make so much money trading? Is it because they're right more often? No. It's because when they have a lot of edge, they place a big bet. When they have a small edge, they place a small bet. And when they have no edge, they do what, Ed? They don't bet. And that simple concept right there is a game changer for your trading. All you have to do is have the discipline to think that way to improve your performance. Pop quiz time. You ready, Ed? You ready? Yep. This is a big moment for you. If you had a 95% chance to win a bet, would you place that bet? Yes. <clears throat> Let's try that again. OK, how about this? When you win, I'll give you a million pounds. And you lose, you give me 10 million pounds. No. Ah, so what did he forget to think about? He thought about the 95% like some of you did in the room. If you have a 2% chance to win in a game, would you play that game? Slow your thinking down. Ha! Potentially, I've just converted this man from a person who might never make money trading to someone who can actually make a substantial amount of money trading. What else do you need to know? The reward. Thank you. How much am I going to make if I'm right? How much do I lose if I'm wrong? And at the end of the day, Ed, what I want you to understand is that if you have no edge, you don't make a trade. If you do have a small edge, you make a small bet. And if you have a large edge, you make a large bet. So today, would you say that you learned how to think about edge? I agree with you. You found your edge. Thank you very much. Random plus for Ed, please. Thank you. You can take your pound. <laughs> Thanks. Not a complex concept. Not a difficult way of thinking. Simple. Simple thought process. Slow the thinking down. Stop getting distracted by the probabilities and ask yourself about the whole equation. The second piece of the puzzle, consistent trading process. I'm going to show you a template that I've designed over the years to help people that have the skill set focus their process, to put a framework in place for them so they can be consistent in their trading process. It's not just understanding the probabilities and understanding when I should place a bet and when I shouldn't place a bet. But you also have to understand how does that lay into your specific, unique approach to trading, whether it's systematic, whether it's purely discretionary, whether it's technical, whether it's fundamental. It doesn't matter to me. I have seen people make money with a variety of approaches. The important thing is that you have an approach and you consistently stick to it. So the first part before you enter the trade, You want to list the reasons you want to be in the trade. Does anybody here do that? Write down the reasons why you're putting a trade on? I see heads going like this. I'll go back to the first question. Why are you trading? Entertainment or to make money? If it's to make money, then this is a job. This is a real job. It looks like it's something easy to do because you push a button and, and you get excited and energized. But if you actually want to make money, you have to treat it like you would a job. And that means sticking to a process and developing a process. And then when you put the trade on, you've got to calibrate it. Score how important each of those items are. How relevant is this piece of information or this data point that I look at to doing the trade? Then the trade moves. You establish conviction and sizing through some formula. I'm going to show you the template. There's a little card in your books, actually, that's printed with this exact template, which I'll show in a second. And then at time two, you, you rescore. Time two could be a day later, a week later, a month later. It doesn't matter. But the point is you're rescoring. How important was the reason when I got in the trade? How important is the reason now? Looking at the trade as if you are not in the trade. Because what happens is, once you're in the trade, you start to think emotionally. Does the market know your positions? Feels like it, though. Does the market know your P&L? Feels like it, though. You have to objectify the process. I promise you, the market is not out to get you. 
I have never seen your portfolio on anyone's screen. I'm sure it's, it's only on your screen at home. The market is not trying to destroy your career or your lives. And it doesn't know your stop levels. It hits your stops and then bounce off it. It feels like it happens. But that's because you're taking it personal. And then you reestablish your conviction and sizing in the trade. That's what the template looks like. So go ahead, the card, pull the card out of your books, please. This will be a learning moment. My coaching manual, I chose to, I don't, I don't publish that book publicly. The reason why is because I wanted to be able to give this information to people that were professional traders, to people that actually wanted to learn. Rather than me just talking about all the stuff you've already heard about psychology and trading, and I wanted to go to the next level of giving you actionable things. This is the template. This is a template I developed for a long short commodity trader, discretionary trader, happened to be London based, managing a multi billion dollar portfolio. The concept problem was is that the numbers got so big it was freaking him out. The PL swings were so big it was freaking him out because he's human. So I got him to break it down to pieces. Daily reminders on the top. These are his rules. Trade to make money, not to be right. The path is more important than the idea. Think in terms of probabilities. Basis points are percentages rather than dollars. Anybody here thinking their P&L in terms of dollars? Stop doing that. When you do that, it turns into things called tangifying. It turns into a car, a mortgage, a house, kids camp, whatever it is. Percentages, probabilities. Trading is a game of probabilities, not perfection. It's 45 to 55%. You're not trying to be right all the time. You're trying to know when you have mathematical edge and when you don't, and then place bigger bets when you do and smaller bets when you don't. And is my current size in line with my conviction level? Is my current size in line with my conviction level? Time one. There's the trade, long X, Y, Z. Reasons A through J in the trade. How important is the reason today? On a scale of one, not very important, to five, very important. How important is that today? That's the calibration. Sum of parts. You're breaking it down piece by piece. It's hard enough. Hard enough to make money trading. But if you're battling yourself, it's even harder. Is this fun? What do you think? What's your name? Yeah, did I catch you spaced out? Deepak. Deepak. Do you think this is fun? Do you think this would be fun to do? Of course not. This is not fun. This is not enjoyable. This is not. If you want to have fun, go to a casino. If you want to be smart, write a book. If you want to make money, do this. The people that make money trading aren't any smarter than you. They're not, they don't have access to better resources or information or computers. That's not the differentiation. It's just not anymore. They're just more disciplined. They just have a process that they follow religiously. And it's hard. And they hire me to hold them accountable. And I literally look at them and I say, I don't understand why you want to do this. You have three wives. Six kids, they all hate you. You have a jet, an island. What's the point? They look at me, and the answer I get all the time is, not about the money. It's not about the money. It's about the game. It's about winning. It's about the discipline. You think while you're trading is to make money. The reality is, is that you're doing it for other reasons. And they're not healthy reasons. But you can change that. Very simply change that. Putting process in place and being willing to commit. Has anybody tried to lose weight or quit smoking? Anybody in the room that's tried those things? Is it easy to do? No. Has anybody been successful in doing it? That same thought process, I kid you not, that same psychological barrier is the same thing I'm talking about right here. The only difference is you quit smoking, maybe you get to live longer. You trade with process, you get to make more money. Not to mention the psychological impact of you're probably going to be more pleasant to be around and you're going to be a happier person in general and feel more successful. All those other cascading things come along with it. It amazes me. 
when I work with traders at all levels, the, the, they want the, 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 they ask for like, what's the magic formula, the secret whatever, the, what, what do I not know? You know everything there is to know. What three things can any market do? What's your name? What, uh, what, yeah. William, what, what three things can any market do? Wow, you must have a PhD in astrophysics. Maybe you do. Did you hear what he said? What three things can it do? What's your name? Yeah. What three things can a market do? Are you positive? That's the game. Up, down, sideways. You make it more complicated. You make it more difficult, more challenging. Once you've calibrated the score, you get a total points number. I just made it a one to five scale. It doesn't matter what the scale is. The point is that there's a scale. And the total points there is 31. That 31 means nothing. It's just a relative marker is all it is. Because at time two, we're going to add up the numbers again and come up with another value system based on those numbers. It's 31. And then on the top there, I have a point range. If it's between 30 and 40 points, then it ranks as a, somewhere between an A and B conviction. And, and I should have four risk units on. Do you see, I didn't mention the word dollar, money, P&L. None of that stuff came in here. Risk units. I should have four risk units on, whatever that's defined by your parameter of how much capital you are. It doesn't matter to me how you figure that out. But four risk units are more than one risk unit. That's all you need to know. And it's less than five and more than three. That's all you need to know. With that point system, I have four. Now, the problem is, is you only have 2.5 risk units on because you're trading a little scared because you just got mopped up and, and you're, you're a little on your heels, which is fine. That's normal. But I want you to face the reality. You need to increase it 60%. Doesn't mean you're going to, because you might have very good reasons based on your P&L, based on your loss limits, based on your stop levels. I'm not judging any of that. But I want you to have the conversation with yourself. I want you to lay it out objectively. That's time period one. You see where it goes, time period two? Time period two, we recalibrate those data points. Maybe the points go up to 40. Because you're looking at the trade are these reasons, how important are they right now? Not when I put the trade on. Problem with game plans. Uh, did you say game plans at the beginning that they're important? I think you did. No? Someone did. Anyway, the problem with game plans is you put them on the beginning of the trade. That's the good part and the bad part. The good part is you put it on the beginning of the trade. The bad part is then the world starts happening and things start happening. So then you start to wonder, do I change my game plan, stick to my game plan? You get in that kind of foggy area. The market doesn't know where you're long or short from, does it? Of course not. You're making decisions based on where you are, and you're probably trading your P&L, meaning you're staring at your P&L and saying, wow, that's a lot of money. Well, not for a 600-pound dude over there, but yeah, most people that's like, wow, that's a lot of money. I got to get out of the trade. Well, I'm down a lot of money, as opposed to looking at it objectively, some of parts approach. The combination of probability-weighted decision-making and consistent trading process, what it does is sets the foundation for a stable and repeatable and consistent returns. And that's what you want, stable, repeatable, and consistent returns, because it allows you to always know why you're in a trade, the current reason, not why you did it before, but why you're in it right now. It allows you to quantify your level of conviction for placing a bet and systematically determine the size of your bets. Systematically. It's no longer about your comfort zone. It's about the, day, the sum of the parts say I should be this big. And then you need to stretch your comfort zone. And it helps you dramatically improve your discipline around managing losses. Because you're looking at it at independent points along the curve. Probability weight decision making plus a consistent trading process. That is called edge. And that one simple thing is what makes great traders great. Remember, no edge, no bet. Small edge, small bet, big edge, big bet. And I have four minutes left, and I'm going to run through 10 best practices. These are things, when I look at my experience working with top performers, 
mistakes they've made, what makes them great, what do they have in common. These are the 10 things I want to walk through and show you. Up, down, sideways. They have the mentality of keeping it simple. Before the open, ask yourself, is today to make money, limit losses, or do nothing? Doesn't matter if you need to make money, or if you're in a hole, or you're up money, you have to ask yourself the question, is the market going to pay me today for my positions? And then trade it that way. Because where you get messed up is when you have your own agenda going into it, and the market, it's one of those days that the market's just not paying. And you fight it, and you fight it, and you fight it. Before you put a trade on, write down your game plan. Your why. Why are you in this trade? What's your entry levels? What's your level of conviction? Does your size match your conviction level? What levels are you going to add? What levels are you going to take off? Have that established ahead of time. Everything I'm talking about here is outlined in the book. I think this is actually page 14 or 15 where I talk about the process of how to think about these things. And what happens is oftentimes you get a mismatch. You'll have A conviction and C size. Or you'll have C conviction and A size because you're getting desperate and emotional. A conviction, A size, B conviction, B size, C conviction, C size. Making money is easy. Did you know that? Did you guys know that? I'm not being flipped when I say that. Why do I say it's, it's easy? What's 45 to 55% again? Remember that number? What was that number representing? Average winning percentage of all traders? So you're going to make money half the time. You already make money. You want to have an interesting exercise? Break down your trades to how much you make and how much you lose. Make two separate columns. What you'll find out is that there are probably three or four trades, maybe it's three or four trades a month, maybe it's three or four trades a year, that you give back a ton of profits on. It's that one trade, and if you look at it and you're honest about it, you'll say, you know what, I knew I should have gotten out of that trade, and I could have cut the loss in half, but you didn't. You got emotional, added to it, held on to it. For whatever reason, you lost your discipline. Making money is not the hard part. Keeping is actually the hard part. H plus W plus P equals E. That could be the most important thing you ever tell yourself as a trader. Anytime you're hoping, wishing, or praying, you need to exit the trade. Push the button, start to get out. I don't care if you get out of 10%, 50%, all of it. Live to fight another day. H plus W plus P equals E. Hoping, wishing, praying, start to exit the trade. You make dozens of trades a year, hundreds of trades a year, thousands of trades a year. Your performance is not going to be judged on one trade. Look at your positions as if they're not your positions. Elevate yourself from the positions. Look at it like, anybody here a parent? I have three kids, right? I try to look at their lives from a different lens. I try to, I try to see it not as the parent of this one where it's like, oh, I can't believe he did that. And now I'm like very upset because of my own biases and agenda. I'm trying to think of it more objectively. Elevate yourself, just like your trading book. Elevate yourself mentally and look at it as if these were not your positions, as if it's not your P&L. If I had no positions on right now, what would I do? That should be your mantra. Anybody here meditate? That should be what you meditate to. If I had no positions on right now, what would I do? Train yourself to view your portfolio more objectively. Avoid tangifying. That word actually doesn't exist, but it fits pretty well. Tangifying is the act of turning P&L into stuff. That's why I asked you before. Do you think in terms of dollars or pounds as opposed to percentages and basis points. On the trading floors, we talked in terms of ticks. I made 10 ticks, lost 5 ticks. Yeah, I knew a tick was $12.50, but that wasn't the point. So to do the math. It's one step further away from I just lost you know, 4,000 pounds. Oh my god. Because then you start to equate with what that actually physically is in the real world, as opposed to its percentage. I'm up a percent, down a half percent, basis points. That's the mentality. What will happen is the numbers get too big. Psychologically, it becomes crippling. I've seen this happen with clients. And that's why I have them convert their P&Ls or not even stare at them. They don't even need to, you don't even know your P&L. Doesn't matter. Look at it once in the morning, once at night, you're good. You sit there and watch it during the day. How many times you look at your P&L? What a waste of time and emotional volatility. And you're living and dying with every single P&L tick. It's the same thing like you smoke cigarettes and say, you know what, I'm going to stop smoking. It's hard to do. I get that. But if you're really focused and determined to be your best, you have to have the discipline. Number six, focus on the trade, not the money. It's the trade that you want to focus on. 
Take your daily P&L off the screen, cover it. Trust your process because process leads to profits. The best part about being at Bloomberg right now is I don't know who in the IT department decided that red should be the negative number and blue or green should be the positive number. But here's what I did find out in working with people. What color are stop signs? Hmm. What color are traffic lights when you have to stop? What color was it when you're going to school and you got something wrong, what color pen was used? Red actually is a psychologically anxiety provoking color. Change the color to purple. Purple's a pretty color. And your pants are nice, they're nice red pants. But in general, the concept here I want you to think about is make it easier for yourself. You can actually change the colors on the screen. The default happens to be red, but you can change the colors. And if you can't, and you don't use Bloomberg, figure it out. Or maybe switch to Bloomberg and say, I want to use them because I can switch from the red to the purple. Purple's a much better color. And by the way, do you have a shorter position? So you're short a position, the market's down, it's flashing, flashing, flashing. Now you're getting the signal inside of anxiety, yet you're making money. That's called a mixed message. Make probability wage decisions. Use probabilities to figure out when you have an edge and to help you determine the proper size of your trade. Remember the coin game, Ed, showed us? Probability of winning times the upside minus the probability of losing minus the downside. Ed, if you had a 99% chance of winning a game, would you play that game? There you go, baby. There you go. Happy to give you my money to trade any day of the week, Ed. I'm just kidding. But conceptually, yes, I would. He's thinking like a trader. And you saw it happen. You saw it happen. Now he's thinking like a trader. Market does not know your positions or your P&L. The market doesn't owe you anything. And the market's not out to get you. Yes, it feels like that, but that's not the case. And number 10, and most importantly, keep a trading journal. Does anybody keep a trading journal? One person, two people, three people, four people. There's got to be 125 people in this room. 125 hands should be going up. And if you don't before, now you do. And if you say to me, well, I don't know where to start, yeah, page 55, 56, 57, there's a template in that book that'll get you started. I don't care if it's a journal about your thoughts and emotions. I don't care if it's a journal that's more systematic. Keep a journal. Every single great trader I've ever worked with kept a trading journal. And I want to close on this. Final takeaway. No edge, no bet. Small edge, small bet, big edge, big bet. Thank you all very much for your time today.